Hi, welcome to New Covenant Ministries Church. I'm your host, Pastor Gary Hooper. You know, Jesus was teaching his disciples in John 8, 31, 32. He said, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So let's get a little bit more freedom activated in our lives today as we go into the service. You know, during praise and worship, you can, it's, it's like, when you think about the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit finally, I mean, he lived in heaven for thousands of years. But there came a day when he came to earth. And he came to earth in Jerusalem because there were a bunch of people there seeking him. But really, his presence came to the entire earth at that time. And, he, and he's never going to leave. He's here now. And... Uh, so that would be like, like God's power is always present to heal you. What I mean by that is I was thinking, you know, I got saved in the backyard of a drug dependency center. There was no one there to lead me to the Lord, but the Holy Spirit was there. I could fill up the Holy Ghost in the basement apartment that I was living in while I was reading a book that says tongues is not for today. And in the middle of the book, I began to speak with other tongues. No, but what I'm saying is God's power is present anytime. It's like the power in this building is always here. But when I come in at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning, I turn on the switch. But the power is here. I didn't produce the power. I simply turned on the switch. And I didn't walk up to it with fear and trembling, thinking, oh, oh, I hope this works. I read that power is available from Nova Scotia Power, but what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't? No, it works. Healing works the same way. Prosperity works the same way. And when you put your hands up, this is what I saw this morning. Now, you know, you know God will speak to you through sil- me through silly illustrations. I saw one of those pinatas. You know, that they have birthdays and stuff, and it's full of all kinds of good things, but you've got to keep poking at it and poking at it. And God's power is present here. But when you poke up into that, I'm not talking about just standing here, blah, 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 and I'm going to the Swiss LA afterwards, and blah, blah, blah. No, no, I'm talking about entering in to praise and worship. When you enter into that place, you're poking into the power of God. And even if you don't feel any different, I didn't feel any different when I turned on the lights here this morning. I didn't go, oh, I feel so much better now. No, I could, I could see. I could just see. That's all you have to do is see. And so if you take your seed in your hand, you know, Genesis chapter 8, 22, it's interesting that we would be using this verse and it's right in the middle of Noah. How many saw the movie Noah? Good for you, you didn't go. That's wonderful, don't waste your time. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's minus 50. They got the name right. Kudos for they got the name right. That was it. That was it. That was the only story. They showed him as a killer. Noah, the Bible says, was a preacher of righteousness. And God was not trying to kill all of those people. God was trying to save all those people, but they refused. It sounds a lot like today. Which is why on Good Friday, I found this out. Nobody knows this but me and God. During praise and worship. Now, we never have a Good Friday service why? Because, because we believe in going from religion to reality and nothing happened on Friday. You can't be crucified on Friday and be in the grave three days and three nights and get out of the ground on Sunday morning. Anybody with fingers can prove that is not factual, right? So we haven't done that, but during praise and worship, I heard the Lord say, I want you to treat, preach on the true Noah on Good Friday morning. You know, praise the Lord. And so, why? Because there is a death, a burial, and a resurrection in that story. And so that's what we're going to do on Good Friday. Surprise, surprise. Surprise to everybody. Surprise to me. Okay. (laughs) But if you're in Genesis 8.22, 
Wow, such, such enthusiasm. <laughs> no, but see, what you have in your hand, what you have in your hand is a seed and it is your future is in your hand right now. See, God gave you everything that you needed. We found that out in Ephesians 1.3. He's already supplied you with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. So in order to tap into it, you've got to take the seed that he gives you and plant it into the kingdom of God. It's as simple as that. How do I know it works? Because here in Genesis 8.22, it says as long as the earth remains. Well, we're here, and it's here. And so the earth is still remaining, and he said as long as it remains, the, you know, the bottom line is seed time, or seed plus time, and harvest shall not cease. So the world is by buying and selling, but the kingdom of God, it's by sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that also shall he reap. So again, you sow love, you reap love. You sow hate, you reap hate. You sow money, you reap money. Whatever you sow, you reap. And then in Galatians 6, 9, he said, You will reap in a due season, if you don't quit, don't faint, don't cave in. So everything that you have in your hand is seed, and everything that God has in His hand is harvest. And so when you release your seed, when I give Him what I've received, I can get what He's got. No, no, I'll get what He has promised when I sow my seed, right? So just say this with me. Psalm 35, 27 says, Psalm 35, 27 says, I'm the shout, shout for joy. I'm glad. I'm glad I favor his righteous cause. I, his righteous cause. I, continually, say, I continually say, let the Lord be magnified. Let the Lord be magnified. He, takes he takes pleasure in my prosperity. My prosperity. And my tongue, my tongue, this tongue, this tongue will, speak will speak nothing else but his righteousness his and his praise, his praise all the day long. You know, even the world has figured out the power of a positive confession, you know. Just think, we're the church and God gave it to us, the whole book. He said, exceeding great and precious promises, you can partake of His divine nature. So the Holy Spirit came, His power is here, His power is here to heal, His power is here to prosper. If you could believe Him, this is the truth, if you could believe Him, you could be totally debt free by two o'clock this afternoon. I have a friend, Mike Kennedy, and Mike called me up one day and he said, I called you. This is a sad part of the story. He said, I called you to tell you this because I knew that you wouldn't be jealous. He said, he said, now I know Mike, Nancy and I have stayed at his house in Branson, Missouri, beautiful home, but they had a $240,000 mortgage on the house. How many of you know that's a heavy payment to make at the end of every month? He got a phone call one day from a guy that he never met, a 26-year-old businessman in New York City, called him up and said, hey, uh, you don't know me, but blah, blah, blah. And I need the number of your bank account. God told me to pay off your mortgage. Mike said, you know how much it is? He said, well, it doesn't matter. He said, God told me to pay it off. The next day he was debt free. No, he could be looking for you right now. That's why you got to let go. See, sometimes you just got to let go of something that's not enough. Come on, they brought the loaves and the fishes to Jesus in John chapter 6. And he took their not enough and lifted it up to the Father and blessed it and fed 5,000 people. That's what we do when we bring in the tithes and offerings here in the church. We believe that it won't just take care of the bills here in the church, or, but we believe that it's God's intention for it to advance the kingdom, which is also advancing your life. Because in Deuteronomy 8.18, it says that he gave you power to get wealth to establish his covenant. Well, one of the ways he establishes his covenant in the earth is to make your neighbors look at you and say, we're... What is going on with them? In this, in this world that, that things don't seem to be going right, these guys are always happy, and even when things look bad, they turn, it always turns out good for them. Because Romans 8.28 says, all things, not some things, all things work together for your good because you've been called by Him for His purpose. Amen. Praise God. Let's go ahead and take up the offering because you better. Glory to God. His favorite people are here today. God's favorite people are in the house. 
look at somebody next to you and say, if it's not you, I know it's me. What do you mean he has favorites? Yes, Peter, James, and John. You mean he liked them better than the rest? No, he loves everybody. But they pushed in. They pressed in. John wrote about himself and said, I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. That's what you need to be able to say about yourself. I don't know about you, but I'm that person that Jesus loves. <laughs> he just likes me. Amen, he does. He rejoices over you with singing, Zephaniah said. Can you believe that? Yes, of course you can. He dances and he sings when he thinks about you. He's taking pictures of you when you learned how to walk, when you learned how to talk. Now, now you might not have learned how to talk until you were 30 years old. Because he's not talking about English or Hebrew. He's talking about faith. <laughs> when you begin to speak his word, that's when you learn how to talk. When you begin to speak his language, you know, other than that, it's just goo, goo, ga, 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 ga. It's not until he watches, Jeremiah 1.12 says, he watches over his word to perform it. It's a good thing he doesn't perform your words. Aren't you glad of that some days? All your grumbling and complaining stuff. You wouldn't want the harvest of that now, would you? No, he watches over his word to perform it. And he wants you to grow up to learn how to talk like him, act like him, be like him. How do you know that? Because 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, His Holy Spirit is in reigning, reigning in your life. There's liberty, there's freedom, and you're being changed from glory to glory into the image of Him. That means acting like, talking like, and being like Him. He wants you to act like, talk like, and be like Him. And the only way that I can be like Him is to know what He's like. The only way that I can love like Him is to know how much I'm loved. Right? Okay, Matthew chapter 5. <laughs> we were in the Sermon on the Mount for a little while here, and so we're going to go back to it. And it says here in chapter 5, verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And they, he went up and sat down, and his disciples came to him. So he wasn't talking to a huge, huge crowd. He was talking to the Talmudim. Now that's not just the 12, that's the 70 plus, that's the people that wanted to to press into God and be his disciples. And so they came to him and he began to give them some private instruction on how to be a disciple. And so he opened up his mouth in verse 2 and taught them. You see, Jesus did three things in his ministry. He taught, he preached, and he healed. That's what he did. It's back in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. So here he's teaching them and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Notice it's not poor in pocket. It's poor in spirit. How many of you have been poor in pocket? How many of you have had craft dinner every way you can cook it and know that it wasn't all that great? Hamburger helper didn't help you at all, did it? Come on. <laughs> Come on. No, there's no blessing in that. He's talking about poor in spirit. And poor in spirit is just an attitude. It's like, it's like, it's like God, I'm nothing without you. It's all that it is. It's humility. It's like everything I am is totally dependent upon God. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, the next verse is, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that's not crying over yourself. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about godly sorrow, not grief. Grief is a negative spirit from the devil. We're talking about godly sorrow. You mess up and you feel guilty about it. You feel bad about it. And so you go and you repent about it and you get cleaned up about it, right? So godly sorrow is lost fellowship. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 says that it'll lead you back into right fellowship with God. Then the next one, of course, the third one is blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And in Numbers chapter 12, Moses was writing and he said Moses is the meekest man on earth and he called himself that meek man. And so we found out that meekness was not weakness, but it's power under authority. And meekness is really also the ability to receive from somebody greater. You realize that without him, again, you're nothing. So then the, the fourth one was blessed are they that hunger and thirst. And what's important about that is, you know, over in John's gospel, he said, if you come to me, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. But, but really what he's saying here is you, will, you, you won't be completely satisfied. You'll be continually satisfied. When you're hungry and thirsty after him, you'll be continually satisfied, but you never get to a place where you're completely satisfied. 
You're always hungry and thirsty for more manifestation, more of the Word of God and all of those kind of things. And so we talked about that. You know, and then we looked at, you know, what controls your hunger is what controls your life. And so how important it is that we're chasing after God, even though He's, <laughs> he's here with us and He's in us and all of that. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, a paradox, you know. But, but again, we're always hungry. Like I cannot, for myself as an example, Saturday morning is my favorite time because I get dropped off at the office here. And even if there are people in the building here, they don't know I'm here. And I can go upstairs and I can just get them off and I can stay in the Word all day. And there's no distractions. There's nothing else going on and I refuse anything else. And to me, it's such a special time. Or a time in a car with a good teaching tape on or CD rather, or good praise and worship or something like that. But again, that's the, that is an appetite that I created just like I created an appetite for football or some of the other analogies that I used. But see, all these first four our input, things that I need to, you know, get in me so that the output can start in the next verse, blessed are the merciful. So in um, 5.7 it says merciful, and it's the word uh, el imon, and it means kindness that's manifest to those in need. Kindness to, that's manifest to those in need, or a readiness to help, we could say it that way. So I got past selfishness. Doing those first four, I got past selfishness. And so now when I'm praying, I'm not praying about me. I'm praying about Carolyn or something. You, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 uh, I, and because I'm confident by the time I get through those first four, he's going to take care of me. You know, I, I'm not here to be employed. I've been deployed. I'm on a mission. And even the anointing that I have on my life to preach, it's not for me. It's not to make me look good. It's to, to make you better. You know, and when the anointing lifts after the teaching is over, I, I got to go over to 1 John chapter 2 where the Bible says that we've all received an unction or an anointing from the Holy One. And I got to live up my Christian life just the same as everybody else. See? And so everything, but, but the anointing, even the gifts of the Spirit, they're, you know, the word of wisdom, knowledge, and faith, and healing, and miracles, and all that, that's not so that somebody can show off. No, that's so that somebody can meet the needs of the people. It's not about, oh, look at me, I got the power. No, it's about compassion. It's about, hey, God loves you, and He wants to manifest Himself to you. You know, He wants that healing flow to get to you know, so that you'll know that your love from the Father above, you know, He wants to flow healing into you to, to, to hook you up with Him, right? Hi, Pastor Gary Hooper here. Uh, glad to, to hook up with you in your home or on your phone or however you've connected with us today. I'm reading uh, from uh, Paul's last letter to the church at Corinth, and the final verse is very interesting because he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And of course, that word communion is the word koinonia in the Greek, and it means partnership, fellowship, intimacy, responsibility. It means all of that it means that they were collectively working together. Like Paul said in Romans 1.14, they had a debt to win the lost at any cost. And so if you'd be interested in partnering up with us to advance his kingdom, the information will be appearing on your screen. And uh, God bless you. To become a covenant partner with us or to make a donation, please visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca or phone us toll free at 1-866-296-WORD. That's 1-866-296-9673. So blessed are the merciful, kindness that is manifest to those in need, ready to help, we could call it love in action. Ben Campbell Johnson, what's he say about it? He says, oh, how fulfilled are those that can forgive other people for God will forgive them. Well, we know that that's true anyway. He forgives you trespasses as you for." Give those that trespass against you. But now let's go over to um, uh, Lamentations. Lamentations was Jeremiah, and it's at, at the end of Jeremiah. 
And the thing about Lamentations is it's all in acrostics. Acrostics is uh, the Hebrew alphabet written verses 1 to through 22. And in a couple of these chapters, it's 48, and I think it's 166. But again, each verse is, is uh, indicated by a Hebrew letter, and the Hebrew letter gives a, a deeper meaning to, to the verse that you're looking at. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but I'm just sharing that with you in case you want to dig it out for yourself. But here in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, and again it's tagged on to the end of Jeremiah, and it's verse 22. So when you read verse 22, knowing that there's only 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, you realize you're getting to the end of something. You know, before you get into verse 23, the thought of a new thought, uh, thing here. So in verse 22, look at this. Hmm. He said, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because His compassions, they fail not. That word compassion, I, I looked that up several different, trans, several different places, and it all said the same thing. Belly or womb. And so you get the idea of a womb with a baby in it, and the baby is pushing to get out. And so when he says he has bowels of compassion for you, it's, it, you know, there's something moving out of God toward you all the time. Just moving toward you. So again, so what is mercy? Well, grace is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do, right? So, so that is love in action, right? But the letter Tav here, the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, is the, the letter for truth and perfection. So here's, here's the, the perfectness of God. It's of the Lord's mercies. And this word mercy in this particular place is hesed, which is a covenant term for covenant kindness. It's not something that you earn. It's something that because you came in covenant with Jesus, it belongs to you. It will always be there for you. I like the next verse as well. His mercies are when? New every. So, so, no, but this is good because you might have messed up yesterday. But look at this. His kindness, His hesed, his, it's new. His covenant kindness is new every morning. So you might have acted like a real idiot yesterday and thought you exhausted it. Well, you didn't. <laughs> I can tell by all you sweet people. I'm talking to the people live streaming. You, you know, the people out there that have their problems. You know, not here, of course. So, so His mercies are new <laughs> every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Wow. Now, the story that I, this morning I felt this, we need to go to 2 Samuel chapter 4. And it's a story that I've taught here many times, but it's such an indication of hesed. There's not a better illustration that I have found in the Bible. Because 2 Samuel chapter 4 is a story about Adam, it's a story about you, and it's a story about Jesus, and it's a story about His Father God. And it's all encapsulated in a story here about a guy named Mephibosheth. Now Mephibosheth in the Hebrew means shameful thing. How many of you would like to have a name like that? Hey, shameful thing. That was his name. And some of us carried that name too from, you know, an ugly uncle or a bad mother or a bad father or somebody. Shame was put on you when you were a little child and you never ever got past it. And so, you know, but here in verse 4 of chapter 4 it says, And Jonathan, now Jonathan is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. How is that, Pastor? Well, because Jonathan was the king's son. Saul was the king. He had a son named Jonathan. Jonathan was the prince who should have been the next king. But Jonathan, Jonathan, over in 1 Samuel chapter 18, entered into a covenant with David, and he took off his royal purple robe and put it on David. David took off his old sheepskin coat and put it on Jonathan. Uh, Saul, or da Jonathan rather took off his weapons, his weapon belt, and put it on David. And David took his slingshot and passed it to Jonathan. Jonathan took off his crown and dropped it on David, and David had nothing else to give him. 
But, you know, God gave you, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand in an evil day. And after having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, with your loin belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. God made the exchange with you and I as well through Jesus Christ, see. So this was what happened. And so, but now here is Jonathan. Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth didn't know it. He's just a child. But what happened was Saul and Jonathan were killed on Mount Gilboa, which meant that David would be the next king. And they assumed when David takes over as king, because this was normal practice, you go and kill all the offspring of the former leader so that they, so that they can't take your position away from you. So they, now they didn't know that there was a covenant between Jonathan and David, and that covenant was eternal. They didn't understand that. So here in verse 4 of chapter 4, it says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son. He was lame in his feet. Well, how did it happen? Well, let's read. He was five years old when the news of Saul and Jonathan came out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and ran away. And it came to pass that as she was running away, she had dropped him off her donkey. And he fell and became lame in both of his feet. And I have found this as a pastor, that when I encounter people that don't seem to live the way that I think they ought to live, there's a good chance that they've been dropped somewhere along the way. <laughs> you know, they, they, just, they just don't act right. Somebody dropped them. Things can happen to you that are so devastating, so overwhelming, that in your whole life you don't ever recover from them. You know, those things happen to people. This is why God gave us His Word, so that He could get us beyond all that. But now over in chapter 9, verse 1, it talks about what happened when David took the throne in, in Jerusalem. He had already been king in Hebron, but now he's coming over to Jerusalem to be the king over all of Israel and Judah. And here's the first thing that he did when he took his place on the throne. <laughs> this is so awesome because this is what Jesus did as well. And David said, verse 1, Is there any left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for whose sake? Yeah, in your case, it's for Jesus' sake. Now he's looking to show hesed or covenant kindness to somebody that he's never met. That's the mercy and the grace of God right there. He hadn't even met this guy. And there was in the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. We don't have time to get into all of this, who Ziba represents and all that. But, and when they had called on to David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? He said, Yes, your servant or your slave I am. And the king said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show hesed to him, or covenant kindness, go on to him? Ziba said, Yes, there is Jonathan. He, he had a son, this Jonathan had this one son that's left that didn't die. And he was lame in both of his feet. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. What happened to you wasn't your fault. You didn't. You know, so many times you, you talk to somebody, some girl that got raped, and they, they blame themselves for something that horrendous happening to them. They take the shame and the guilt on them. It wasn't your fault. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, He is in the house of Makar. When you look up Makar, it means a salesman. And I, I relate this guy to the devil in one sense. Because this guy, Makar, is living in a place called Dothan, in a desert place, in a place called Lodabar. And Dabar is word, and Lo means no. He was in a place where there was no word. So now here's this man, he's grown up, he still can't walk. He doesn't know that he's got a covenant with the king. Does this sound familiar to anybody? He didn't know that he had a covenant relationship with a covenant-keeping king. And so he was hiding in fear of his life. And I, I can look back and remember my years as an alcoholic and a drug addict. I'm thinking, yeah, I believe there is a God, but I hope I don't never run into him because he's going to wipe me off the earth. That was the attitude that I had toward him. I didn't realize that he was reaching out trying to rescue me. And so, so where is he? He's in a place 
a maker is the son of Amiel, and he's in a place of no word, no light, Lodabar. The king sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence and said. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered and said, Behold your slave. David said unto him, look at this. What's the first thing he said? What's the first thing God ever said to you? Fear not. Hmm. For I will surely prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. I'll lead you in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. And of my mercy, I'll bring you out of trouble. I'll lead you in pastures of plenty and beside still waters and restore your soul. Fear not, for I will surely show Hasid to you for Jonathan, your father's sake. For in, the, in this case, it's for Jesus' sake. Whatever good happens to me is for Jesus' sake. I'm in covenant with Him. I got a covenant yes. and a covenant keeping God. Amen. A Bible full of promises and all I got to do is flip the switch. You know, if I, if, you know but if I walk over to the switch and say, oh, I hope this works, it won't. Not in the kingdom of God, because without faith, you don't get the power turned on. But just as sure as I got saved in the backyard of a drug dependency center, as sure as I got filled with the Holy Ghost in the bedroom of a basement apartment, I can get healed the same way, any place, any time. The power of God is always present to heal you. And it's great to come up to an altar and get prayed for, but God can minister to you anywhere that you'll just flip the switch, flip the switch, flip the switch. I'll show you covenant kindness... Now, but notice that it's for, it's for his father's sake. It had nothing to do with the way that he was living over in Lodabar or any of that. It had to do with covenant. So again, well, you know, God would probably heal me if I just would stop doing this or I wouldn't do that. That's not what he said here. He'll do anything for you if you just believe him. <laughs> There's a weak Amen. And I'll restore, look at this, and I will restore. Now when he talks about restore, all the land of Saul, your grandfather, I'll restore all the land from your whole family from the beginning of time until now. Anything that's ever been stolen from you, I'll restore it back to you because you have a covenant with me. And look at this, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Pass the bread. Pass the healing. Pass me a bowl of prosperity. Hey, Bob, pass me the prosperity. It's down near your end of the table. Thank you. Thank you. I got some prosperity now. I don't need to be concerned about that anymore. Wringing my hands over that. Oh, there's the healing bread over there. I got the healing happening. Healing is the children's bread, Jesus said. Come on. Prepare a table before you, and there you'll eat. But notice it's continually. <laughs> you know, you're completely satisfied? No, you're continually satisfied. Because you hunger and you thirst after righteousness. And he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as me? See, that's an attitude that David ignored, that God ignores. You can come and cry to God and say, Oh God, I'm so unworthy and I'm so this and that. He will not hear you. No, I'm here to tell you he's not going to hear you. He will not hear you demeaning yourself. He will not hear you putting yourself down when you're created in his image and in his likeness. If that's the kind of praying you're doing, it's not ever going to get answered. I can save you some trouble. No, no. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith is the only thing that works. We walk by faith and not by sight. You can cry a million tears, or 96 if you're that old, but, but none of that stuff will work. He's moved by faith, not by need. And more than that, he's moved by seed more than need. Why should you look upon such a dead dog as me? And now David never even responded to that. And I will say, hey, don't be broken, be restored. <laughs> Come on, be restored. Allow God to restore you. Then the king called on to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I've given unto your master's son all that pertain to... Look at this. I've given unto your master's son all that 
pertain to Saul and all of his house. Thou therefore and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him. Angels are in charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Hebrews 1.14 says that angels were sent to minister unto the heirs of salvation. And they're there to work for you. Look at this. <laughs> They'll tell the land for you that your master's son may have food to eat, but Mephibosheth shall sit at the master's table always. I'm seated in heavenly places, Ephesians 2.6 says, seated in heavenly places in Christ. Not getting up and leaving and coming back. I'm seated because, you know, my, my permanent position is I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Temporarily, I'm standing here in front of you, but I'm seated, bless God. Then Ziba said unto the king, verse 11, according to all that your Lord, the Lord has commanded, so shall your servant do as for me. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the, as one of the what? As one of the what? Who are you? Not who somebody told you you were. What does the Bible say about you? The king's son. King's sons. King's daughters. Hoorah! Verse 13 says this. It says, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. So what does that mean to us? That means that you can't walk this thing on your own. You know, you were lame when you came into the kingdom of God. You couldn't do this on your own. And you never get to the place where you don't need him. Matter of fact, if you read John chapter 13, Jesus watching the disciples' feet, and of course, he came to Peter, and Peter said, oh, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, I, I, I need to wash your feet. If you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. And of course, Peter said, well, then, you know, just give me a full bath. Jesus said, no, no, when you're walking in this earth, it's only your walk that gets dirty, and I need to clean up your walk, is what the story meant. And so, so you know, we, you know, it's like my pastor used to say, you can't walk through a garbage dump and not get the smell on you, and you can't live in this earth and not need a shower. You know, but I mean, when you think about it, <laughs> you know, you work outside and you get sweaty, you come in, you have a shower. You work outside and you get sweaty and you come in, you go to church. And church is supposed to clean you up, to wash you off and so they send you off again. And walking out of here feeling like, yeah, you even got behind the ears. It was awesome. <laughs> huh? No, that's the way you ought to be leaving. You ought to be saying, hey, praise God. I, I came in here for a shower of blessing. Just lay it on me, God. I didn't come in here thinking, oh, I'm so dirty. No, I came in here and said, clean me up, God. Amen. See, it's just, again, it's just that attitude shift. I, oh, I can't. You know, people mess up and they want to stay away from church. That's like being dirty and wanting to stay away from the shower. You do it long enough and everybody will know you stink. <laughs> no, you look at people that only go to church once in a while, you can smell them coming, can't you? <laughs> no, you can smell that attitude. Man, it's like, ooh, ooh. That's why lots of times if they haven't been in church in a long time, they'll come in and sit in the back because they know they stink. <laughs> Who's done it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being polite. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I hope you realize that. I sit in the back sometimes in services when I don't want anybody to notice me. And with a face like this, you get noticed. You understand? Okay. <laughs> now my dentist is working on me now, and he's trying to line everything up with my nose. I said, Dean, we have a problem, buddy. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's go to Titus chapter 3. That would be a good thing to get away from there. Yeah. Titus was a Mark T. Barclay preacher, a preacher of righteousness, straight as an arrow, where he went, people got straightened out or ran away. The anointing on his life was so strong, they either got straightened out or they ran away from the anointing. Because the anointing will remove the yoke, destroy the yoke, and remove the burden. And sometimes people have been carrying those yokes a long time. They get around the anointing and they realize it's going to go. And if they feel like it's their identity and they want to stay, they want to stay away from that, 
I like the way I am right now. No, you really don't. Anyway, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says this. Now again, religion will offer you a lesson, but Jesus offers you a life. He came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's not about lessons, it's about living. And God said, I want to show you how to live, how to enjoy your life. I can you might have life and have it more abundantly, and I can tell by your pickle push you haven't been enjoying it. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people live streaming. Now remember, there's us and them. If it's negative, it's them. If it's positive, it's us. Y'all come back next week now, you hear? <laughs> we love you. We're just kidding. Okay. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his hesed. Has he saved us? How did he do that? By the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Washing of regeneration is anachinosis. And anachinosis is, remember he said you don't pour uh, new wine in an old wineskin because it'll, the new wine will pop the wineskin. Anachinosis is when you would take an old wineskin and massage it and rub oil into it and rub oil into it until it got renewed and then you could pour it in the wine. So, so God's rubbing you and massaging you and sometimes it's a deep tissue massage like Scott Neary gives in you. <laughs> How many of you have never had a deep tissue massage? Uh, he'll be signing people up after the service. And, and I'll be videotaping just to watch you scream in agony. Okay. So, so again, it's, it's, it's renewing. It's like a work of the Holy Spirit. It's Romans 12, 1 and 2 as well. I've submitted my body and I'm renewing my mind. <laughs> but, this, but it's peleg genesia in the Greek and it means to begin again. It means to recreate. It means to bring back to a pristine state. It means a radical change. How many of you have experienced a radical change B.C. and A.D.? Before you knew Christ and now, people probably recognize that you're different. They probably think you got weird. Right? I told my friends a long time ago, they said, you're a nut. I said, yeah, I found the right bolt and I got torqued on. I'm, I'm okay now. I found out where this nut belonged. <laughs> it wasn't a loose one anymore. <laughs> Let's go to Psalm 145. I don't know why I keep hitting these acrostics. Psalm 145 is an acrostic psalm too. But in your Bible, it only has 21 verses. But in the Hebrew, it has 22 verses. There's an extra verse that you didn't get. But this is a verse you could put on your fridge. Or, you know, if you're into body piercing, ink. Ink, you're into ink. I know the Bible says not to do it, but, but anyway. So, <laughs> but if you were into it, this would be a good verse to get tattooed on your forehead. Okay. <laughs> I remember when Kyla was little, little, little. I have got a tattoo of a devil on my arm. I apologize. I was there before I ever knew God. But Kyla came over to me and she said, Pastor, you've got a devil on your arm. I said, Kyla, that's a life-size portrait. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> and if that answer said it, she said, well, you know, that's, that's cool. The way she went, you know. So, Verse 8, this is a good verse. The Lord is what? Ticked off. The Lord is so mad at you. No. He's gracious and He's full of something. What is it? Now again, He's wanting me to be like Him, merciful like Him, so I need to be full of compassion. That means I can't be short-fused when I'm on the highway in my car. And somebody in there, you ever notice in the, how many people, like I, I drink coffee at Starbucks, and so they have this little metro thingy in there that you can read, and, and every time you pick it up, somebody got ran over in a crosswalk. You're thinking, this is an epidemic going on here. But what it is, is you got people, you know, talking on cell phones and, and these things that were all the conveniences that were supposed to simplify our lives and, 
and, and now it's just way more complicated than that. And everybody's busy, busy, busy and running one over on the highway. And short fuse, road rage. Oh yeah. But God says, God says, I'm gracious and I'm full of compassion. I'm slow. Slow. Aren't you glad he's slow? Slow to anger. And of great mercy. I like verse 9. The Lord is good to all. I circled all. That means everybody. He's good to the unsaved people. He's good to all. And His tender mercies are over all of His works. Verse 16. All of the works shall praise You, O God, and Thy saints shall bless Your name. Hmm. Verse 10 is the word yod, and that's you know, where you get Yahuda or praise and worship. And it's interesting here because he's saying, if you want real guidance, you know, you just keep your hands up praising God. They shall speak of your glory and of your kingdom and talk of your power. Verse 12 says, to make known to, to the sons of his mighty acts and glorious majesty of his kingdom. Verse 13, the your kingdom is everlasting kingdom and your dominion throughout all generations. Verse 14, the real verse 14 says this. It says, faithful is the Lord in his word and holy in his works. Faithful is the Lord in his word and holy in his works. That's the true verse 14 because there's 22 verses here actually. So what he's really saying to us here is he said, you know, my mercy will get you out of trouble and my grace will keep you out of sin. We could simplify it and bring it into the New Covenant. My mercy will get you out of trouble when you didn't deserve it. And he said, my grace will keep you out of trouble and keep you from sin. Amen. He's good. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea is right after Daniel. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 says this, I have desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And what he's saying here is, he said, well, mercy for me to give mercy to Nancy is I forgive you because I've been forgiven. Now, a sacrifice would be I forgive you because I have to. You know, and so having to forgive somebody is the wrong motive. My motivation should always be uh, God's mercy came to me. His forgiveness came to me. And so I'm just releasing you into that same forgiveness. I, it's not something that I have to generate or work up. It's just who I am because I'm working out my own salvation with reverence and anticipation. And inside of me is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and temperance. Those are the things that are in me that I'm working out. In my flesh, there's other things that I have to get out. <laughs> you have to shower them off with the Word of God, right? So, so again, mercy is... Re and really, mercy is also refraining from retaliation. Like I have got the power to retaliate. Like I was thinking about that when I was reading this the other day. I was thinking... I was thinking about some of the things that happened to me as a pastor uh, and people that have done things to me and some of them were not very big people. But they knew that they could get away with it because I'm a pastor and a Christian. But if I had not been a pastor or a Christian, they would have never dared say or do what they did. To Gary B.C. would have came to their house and had negotiations on the front lawn. No, but when I think about some of the people and some of the things that they've said, but there's still, I still have a line that I'm working on 
You can say what you like about me, but if anybody comes after my wife, I'm going to forget I'm safe for about five minutes and hurt you. <laughs> no, no, that's where I'm at right now, Jamie. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just telling you that, that there is a line. I, and maybe it's not a bad line. I don't know. I just think that when it comes to defending your family, <laughs> you know, like I can take it, but you know. <laughs> Amen. Okay, praise God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. I know that none of you have ever thought things that I have thought. None of you have an imagination that's creative like that. You're just always thinking sweet thoughts. No, have you never just sought, sat somewhere and imagined a better life? I hope you have. Because God wants you to. That's what your imagination was given for. It wasn't for that guy did me wrong and I'm going to get him if it takes the rest of my life. That is a negative use of an imagination. The imagination is, hey, you know what? Uh, people, if I get angry at someone, they control me and I don't want anybody to control my life. But you, sir, I have self-control and I'm under your command because I've been deployed here. And so I want to use my imagine to imagine 3,000 people getting born again. I want to imagine a church where praise and worship starts and people come up and they get healed or they come through the door. Or people, like I have a friend that was in a revival that took place years ago, and he said people would be driving home. It, they were having church every night and people would be driving home from the factory on their way to the bar to get drunk and they would pull into the church and come up to the front and begin to weep and cry because the anointing of God was so strong that people were drawn to it. And I know that it's happening here because there's so much prayer going on in here. No, no, this church is a praying church. This church right now is praying more than we have since we started 20 years ago. And if you don't think there's a difference, then you need to turn up your spidey senses because you can feel, no, you can literally feel the electrical power of God in the atmosphere in here sometimes. And it's like, you know, sometimes they'll be praying in a room and I'll just go somewhere and listen just to get close enough because the waves come rolling by, you know. It's like, I don't want them to know I'm listening because, you know, then all of a sudden they stop or something. Like that. You don't want to do that. But, but right now, <laughs> that's right, you've been found out. <laughs> right now, I mean, 120 people in an upper room and they were believing for a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And there came a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind, whoosh, filled the place where they were sitting. Yeah. Acts chapter 4, it says, they began to pray, and the building began to shake. We haven't seen anything yet. Come on. You know, we can get one, we can get one accord in here, this building will shake. I've got, I've got some people I know down in Corpus Christi, that's down in the bottom end of Texas, right on the, on the Gulf there. And the fire department showed up at their church three or four times to put the fire out on the roof. There wasn't any fire on the roof. It was the fire of God in the people. But it looked like natural fire on the roof. Does that sound far out to you? We serve a far out God. We haven't seen anything. We live so much in here instead of in the Spirit that we, we need to be expecting those things. We need to be saying, God, let your power fall. Come on, Lord, let your power fall. Let your power fall in this place. Pastors Gary and Nancy Hooper, along with their friendly congregation, warmly invite you to join with them at New Covenant Ministries Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. We minister to the whole family with ministry groups for all ages. You'll love the anointed praise and worship, the friendly atmosphere and dynamic teaching of Pastor Gary. Sunday services are held at 10.30 a.m. with midweek services on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at New Covenant Ministries Church, 110 Thorn Avenue in the Burnside Industrial Park in Dartmouth. For more information on our church, other ministries, and for products and Christian resources, visit us online at www.newcovenantchurch.ca or phone us toll-free at 1-866-296-WORD. That's 1-866-296-9673. Learn to live victoriously. Come visit New Covenant Ministries Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada and discover God's plan for your life.